Landerele bosica celere bosanda la la bosse che te libra sica tala la bosse nere bosaka libro sica celere bosaka tala la bosse che te landerele bosica celere bosanda libro sica celere bosanda le le bosica ta le prosica celere bosanda la la bosse che celere bosanda Libra sika kere de bosanda la la bosseke. Libra sika kere de bosanda la la bosseke. Libra sika kala la bosanda la la bosseke. Libra sika kala la bosseke kere de bosanda. Father, we dedicate this program to you, O oh God. We dedicate ourselves to you, O oh Christ your Father. You that we are just about to wait, O oh God. Touch your people. Touch river them, O oh my dear Father.
very busy watching TV, they are very busy visiting friends, but you just need to know that these people that are fighting your lives have altars. They have satanic altars, and they are very dedicated to their altars. The sorcerers, the witches, those people who don't wish you well, they are ever on, on their altars. And I just want to describe what an altar is. An, an altar is a portal. It's, it's just a portal. It, it, it ushers in uh, spirits from one dimension to this dimension, like from, from wherever they are to this planet. So if you're operating on, the, on an altar of God that is dedicated to God, then you, you'll be dealing with angels. You'll be mm -hmm. ushering angels from heaven to this planet. Like Daniel prayed, he, he stayed on his altar 21 days, nonstop, until when an angel landed successfully with an answer to his prayer. So I just want to encourage every Christian to, to be dedicated to their altars. Don't give up, even when it, it seems like you're not having answers to your prayers. You know, Sometimes we want instant answers. We want God to answer immediately. But you know, God's timing is always the best. I just want to encourage everyone to have an altar. You have a place where you, you spend some time in the presence of God. In that place, if things are not happening, let's say you're trusting God for a, a visa, you want to travel to a nation, and you have been denied that visa like three times. Get that visa, lay it on the altar, pray, speak, prophesy, declare whatever you want to see on that visa, and you see things happening. If you're trusting God for marriage, let's build an altar and keep the fire burning on that altar. When we talk about fire, we are talking about prayers. You know, do not give up. Even when the age, you know, when you're aging and people are commenting, you know, people will always say what they see. You know, when, when they see that you don't have eyes, they'll say you're blind. When they see that you're, you don't have two legs, you have one leg, they'll say you're lame. People will say whatever they see. But you get to a point whereby you're not surviving on the words of men but you're surviving on the word of God. You're living by this word. You're surviving by this word. Because what happens on satanic altars is those devil worshippers, the sorcerers, they speak negative words on those satanic altars. They begin to program your life with, with negative words. They say you will never give birth. You will never get married. You will never prosper in life. They begin to speak negatively about you. And the words have... The, the, words, uh, uh, the words can create. The words that we speak can create. That's why I've had cases of people coming to me and telling me, my auntie said that I will never make it in life. And from the time she said it, things are not happening for me because when the auntie spoke, she created. When, when David was fighting with Goliath, yes, it was a physical war, but there was some exchanging of words. You know, Goliath, he said what he wanted to see. And David spoke what he wanted to see. If he had only listened to Goliath, I'm telling you, Goliath would have, would have destroyed David. He would have killed David. But David spoke the word of God. So in that situation that you're going through, I don't know whatever situation you're passing through, whether it is witchcraft, whether they sent a spell on your life, whether your enemies are working against you, it doesn't matter what they do. It is an altar versus an altar. You have to get an altar in your house. When we talk about an altar, we are not talking about a room. It can just be a table, a place where you feel comfortable to pray without disturbance. You know, it is a place where you go to talk to your God. Whenever you go to that altar, you go there expecting to come back with results. You know, it doesn't matter what the situation is like. All you know is that I'm going to this place to talk to my father and I'm coming back with results. It doesn't matter what the doctors have said, whether they have said you have COVID-19, whether they have said you have HIV, whether they say your, the sickness you have is incurable. I'm talking about a God that can even raise the dead. Nothing is impossible with God. I want to encourage every Christian, stop this habit of, of, of uh, relying on on men and women of God. Yeah, it's very okay to listen to different messages. It's very okay, you know, to feed your spirit with different sermons, with the word of God. But 
it is very it is very risky for you to put your trust in a man. It is very risky. If you get your faith, your hope, and everything, and you place it in a man of God or a woman of God, you're making a mistake. Let your faith be built on God. Learn to go and access these things by yourself. You can prophesy. You can prophesy into your destiny. You can speak what you want to speak. You can declare what you want to see. You know, it doesn't matter the situation around you, what you have been through. Even if your pocket says that you're broke, don't go confessing that, that I am broke. Don't confess that because what the enemy wants, the enemy wants to use you. He wants to use your word against you. He cannot create anything. He knows you have the ability to create. So what he's going to do is to create a situation, put a situation that looks hopeless in your life so that he causes you to confess something negative about yourself. If you say that you can never make it, everything I do doesn't prosper, then the enemy begins to use that against you. So I want to encourage you, never speak what you see. Always say what you want to see in your life. Do not allow the enemy to have anything against you. And if you have been speaking negatively, I want you to change the way you speak. Change. Change the way you think about yourself. It doesn't matter whether in your family no one has made it in life, whether there has been failure in your family. You can decide to create success in your family where there are certain things we cannot control. You cannot control where, you, where, you, where your place of birth. You cannot control uh, the kind of parents you want. You know, you don't decide for yourself. You just find yourself in this planet. You just land here safely by the grace of God. If you made it, some people don't even make it. They are aborted. But you just come not knowing what is in stock for you. Now, you have, you have to create your world. And how are you going to create your world? With the word of God. You need to build an altar for yourself. All the men in the Bible that we, we read about, the men of God, the successful men of God, those people who were wealthy in the Bible begin with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These were men of altars. They had altars. They, they never used to, you know, uh, they never had time to go out and, and, you know, waste their time. They were always on the altar. To an extent that Abraham was more than willing to sacrifice his only son to God. You get to that point in life whereby you're like, everything else can wait. It is my moment with my friend. Let God be your friend. If God is your friend, then he will contend with those that contend with you. You don't even have to worry about your enemy. If God is on your side, who can be against you? The Bible is telling us that if God is on your side, who can be against you? So you need to be a friend of God. David was a friend of God. Solomon, King Solomon gave in the house of God, he, he gave to the altar. He, he contributed. They sacrificed to an extent that God was moved. Like God showed up. He came and he asked him now, tell me what you want me to give you. You have to be a person who is dedicated to your altar. And when you're dedicated to your altar, you have to be attentive always to the voice of God. Because the Bible says that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You know, there are certain things you're not going to uh, achieve in life if, if, you're not, uh, if you're not attentive to the Spirit of God. Like, God can just tell you, start building. And you don't have money to build. And God is telling you, start to build. And you start. And by faith, the building shows up. You know? We, are, we, the Christians, do not live by what we see. We survive on faith. We survive by the word of God. It doesn't matter whether you're jobless, whether, whether you don't have money on your account. As long as the spirit of God is working together with you, you will make it to the top. The Bible says you will be above only and not beneath. The head and not the tail. The first and not the last. Even when your child is performing poorly in class, don't, don't call them fools. Tell your child that you will make it. 
I'm so proud of you. I'm very pleased. I know that you will be a great person. Speak those words. Do not allow the enemy to make you confess anything negative. You know, I know these things because I served the devil for 18 years. And on those satanic altars, apart from mixing roots and stems and, and using them against humanity, against people, uh, we used to speak on every, uh, on every herb that we would make. That's why witch doctors are called herbalists. Because they mix roots, they mix stems, they mix leaves, they, they dry them, they, they can even keep them wet or leave them to grow, but they keep speaking words. They keep speaking words. Whatever they want to see happening to your life, they speak. Even when they are switching destinies, they speak negatively. So now, if you also speak negatively about yourself, you're helping, you're enabling the enemy. We don't want such a situation. We don't want the enemy to have a place in our lives. Whether he did whatever he did before he did it because we were feel free to send in your questions. We shall be answering we shall be answering your questions. You can be sending in your questions. Yeah. Yes, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We have been fighting against, you know, these network interruptions, but this message is going to get through no matter what. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen, amen, amen. And, you know, while we are talking about this, uh, I think we'll be able to even go a bit further in depth tomorrow as we're talking about this topic of, of altars. But um, I want to refer, if you will, to the book of Judges. Uh, Judges chapter 13. And... Um, we're going to show you how to make an altar, and uh, it is so crucial, so important that you have to you have to have an altar. We are men and women of the altar. We are priests unto the Lord. So, as you're finding Judges chapter 13, just know that we're talking about Samson and the circumstances that that led to the birth of Samson, all right? There was a story behind it. And so from the 13th chapter of Judges, we can, we can begin to explore what happened during the times of Samson. Holy Spirit, have your way. And from verse 1, we read, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines, for 40 years. From verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah. Of the family of the Danites. Whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren. And bare not. Verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman. And said unto her. Behold now you are barren. And you bear not. But you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware. I pray you. And drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, you shall conceive and bear a son, mm. and no razor shall come on his head. Mm. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God mm. from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the angel was giving conditions for the woman to be able to conceive, and he was giving, the angel was giving conditions for Samson himself. Verse 6, Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. 
So she's saying, I didn't ask this guy where he came from. And he didn't tell me his name, but his face was so bright. So, and he told me, and then verse 7 is where she continues. But he said unto me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah, okay, the Netflix didn't have an interruption. <laughs> Yes, we are back, we are back. So, um, so from verse 13 of Judges chapter 13. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we'll continue with this topic. We know it is a very sensitive topic, and the enemy doesn't want you to, to, to learn about altars because the only thing that has been fighting you are altars. And when you grasp this knowledge, you, you overcome everything. In the business area, you're dealing with altars. In politics, they are altars. At your places of work, you're fighting with altars. But it's just that they will not tell you there are people who are maintaining their jobs on altars. Mm. In banks, when you go for that loan, those people who own those banks, they check those documents that you sign mm. on satanic altars, and they pray. They talk to their gods and tell their gods to, and to enable you fail to pay that loan so that they can confiscate your property. You know, you're dealing with altars. Life is spiritual. We want you to be aware. When you get out of this lockdown, we want your life to shine. We want, you, we want to hear testimonies of people's lives flourishing. You know, you, you're supposed to excel in life because you're a child of God. You're not supposed to be failing in life. You know, yeah, so you can continue. Yes, yes. so we were, we were reading Judges chapter 13, yes. and we were continuing... And the angel had given instructions mm. to Manoah and his wife. And they were going to have a son by the name of Samson. And Samson was to be a judge over Israel and deliver mm. the children of Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. Mm. And so, verse 15, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain you until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when you have your sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why ask thou thus after my name? seeing it is a secret. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it, and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew, Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. So you see what happened. Manoah and his wife placed a kid, a, a, a lamb, a, a baby lamb, upon the, upon the altar to sacrifice it unto the Lord. And as the smoke ascended, this angel also ascended in the smoke and disappeared. Mm -hmm. So we know that an altar is a portal. Mm -hmm. An altar is a raised place, mm -hmm. a place upon which there can be a fire set. An altar is a junction between 
two dimensions between the physical world and the spiritual world. An altar is a is a port of power. An altar is a magnet. A magnet. It can attract. It can pull spiritual items. It can pull beings. It is a doorway. It is like a cell tower. People who are far away from from the cell tower. If you look on your phone, you can see the you can see uh, bars. If you're close to the cell tower, you'll have more bars on your phone in terms of network connection. However, if you are far away from the cell phone towers, you will have less bars on your phone. That means you have less strength of connection, less power of communication, and so on and so forth. So it is with an altar. You need close proximity with the altar of the Lord. Every single last born-again believer most must have close proximity with the altar of the Lord. You must be very close to your altar. So much so that your home should be an altar. My home is an altar. The place where I stay is an altar. I just happen to sleep there. Mm. I just happen to eat and, and shower there and, and, and rest there and pray there. But that place is an altar. Okay? Mm. And an altar is very straightforward. It's quite simple to make. You know, it can just be an ordinary table, uh, like a coffee table like the, the table that you have in your living room. It can be a coffee table, and it does not have to have anything on it. It can just have your Bible. This is the weapon. This is the weapon. So it can just have your Bible upon it. And there, you pray in tongues. You blast in tongues like crazy. And you get used to the idea of being at the altar of the Lord and blasting in tongues. Because upon the altar... Upon any altar, there are covenants. Mm. And the altar brings the covenant to pass. The altar brings the covenant to life. Mm. The altar causes the things that are written in the covenant to come to pass. The altar is so powerful that if you only have an altar at your church, and you only attend church on Sunday and Wednesday, maybe for Bible study, you are not tending to the altar enough. I want you to read Leviticus chapter 6. Let's, let's dash to Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6. And then from verse 12. And I'll read. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. This is a mistake that many Christians are, are making. Mm. The fire upon your altar must be burning, flaming hot at all times. It shall never go out. And that means that your prayer life, because the fire upon the altar is the fire of prayer, mm. fervent prayer, heartfelt prayer. My friend, if your prayer does not move you, then your prayer shall not move heaven. So your prayer must be fiery, heartfelt, mm. something that you mean with all your heart. You pray with every fiber of your being. You don't, don't just pray with your mouth. You turn off your phone. Pray with everything. Pray, mm. with, pray with, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You pray with everything. Mm. All right? Mm. So you keep the fire burning upon the altar. Every morning, every morning, your fire should be hot. You should place fire upon the altar. These were the instructions that Moses gave to the priesthood. Mm -hmm. And we must know that, let's look at First Peter. We are a royal. 
as you uh, reading first mm. Peter, I, I, I remembered when, when I was uh, serving the devil, we used to keep the fire, the, the, you know, the witch doctor has a priest, someone that attends to the witch doctor. So that person, that person's duty is to make sure that the fire on that altar does not go out. Like for them, it is physical, it is physical fire, but it has an impact to the spiritual realm. They will burn incense and do whatever they, you know, uh, they would do. But one thing I remember is their fire would not go out. And every time their the, the smoke would be rising up, they would be speaking whatever they wanted to see. They would be declaring, you know, curses upon their, their customers. You see, if they solve one problem, they bring another problem. Never go to a witch doctor for a solution. You go for a child, they give you a child, and then they bring sickness upon your husband mm -hmm. so that you keep going there. You become a customer. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to keep the money flowing in their circles. They Repeat don't, customer. Yeah, mm -hmm. they don't give you peace. So why they keep, why you go to a shrine and you mm -hmm. find uh, the fire burning nonstop, whether it is raining or not, the priest's duty in, in a shrine is to make sure that that fire is burning. If, if they are using white magic, they will burn incense. If they are using black magic, they will burn firewood. So uh, I just want to encourage you as a believer, I want to encourage you to keep praying. Those banks you're trusting, you go to the banks, they are high-level sorcerers in the bank. Those people in high positions at the bank, mm. they are high-level sorcerers. That's why if today you just woke up with millions of money, the bank people will be interested, they want to know how you, you just automatically went to the top without their knowledge. You, even becoming rich is a crime. Let me tell you, life is spiritual. If you just became rich out of the blue, all of a sudden you'll be arrested. You have to explain how you made it there. You know, So you have to know how to deal with these altars. God can give you success that people cannot even point at. People cannot even explain how you're making it to the top. But one thing about the altar is the altar attracts favor. If it is an altar of God, it attracts life, long life. It attracts success. It attracts health. It attracts whatever good thing that you need in life. A satanic altar will attract problems. That's why people call all the time for prayer because someone went on a satanic altar mm. and began to send problems to you. They came like a magnet. An altar is like a magnet. So if you're not grounded on an altar of God, then you can easily attract things from an evil altar without even your knowledge. Things just begin to go upside down. You went, life was doing so fine, and someone learned that you're doing well. They went on a bad altar because they did not find you strong in the spiritual realm. Your life just began to go down all of a sudden. You can't explain you had a promotion, everyone just stands against you at your place of work, and you're wondering, as if that is not enough, things are not happening at home. You're losing everything. No one just rises up to the top without a backup from the altar. And no one goes down to the bottom without an altar empowering it. So you're either, you're either at the top or at the bottom. Life is spiritual. I just want to encourage you. Keep at the altar. You'll never be disappointed. You may be so busy at your place of work, but when you're driving your car, play some worship music, speak in tongues, you know, be connected. Life is spiritual. Yes. Yes. Now, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. All right? I want you to underline that word, priesthood, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Right. So you are a royal priesthood, okay? The priesthood has instructions. Those instructions were outlined in Leviticus chapter 6 and in other places in the Old Testament, but the main job of the priest was to keep the fire upon the altar burning heart. 
So now just imagine if you only attend church on Sunday and then maybe Wednesday. You know, you're only attending churches twice out of the week. And yet the fire upon the altar must be kept hot in the morning and in the evening, every day. In the morning, you wake up. The first thing you do is tend to the fire upon the altar. And in the evening, the first thing you do is, is make sure that the fire upon the altar does not go out. Mm -hmm. So you start the day with prayer and you end the it day with prayer. prayer. So look, look, at, look at Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. I already know it offhand. But it says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. You see, those are clear instructions. You are to meditate in the scriptures twice a day. Once before the sun comes up and again when the sun goes down. Or once as in the morning and another time in the evening. That is a minimum of twice a day. So you tend to spiritual matters a minimum of twice a day. Yeah. You are tending to spiritual matters minimum twice a day. If you only consult or if you are only close to the altar when you go to church, that means that you're only tending to the altar as a priest once per week. Oh, my goodness. That means your fire had already gone out. Your fire went out by Tuesday. It was already out. So by the time you appear at church on Sunday, again, you are trying to revive those old fires. And yet the fire upon the altar must be kept burning hot, flaming, a raging inferno daily by the priest. The priest must keep the fire upon the altar burning hot every day. So now just imagine you only attend church on Sunday. So your fire had been gone out. Your fire went out long time ago. All right. So this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and day night. So, as you're keeping the fire upon the altar hot, when you tend to the altar in the morning and in the evening again, those are also times of meditation. Mm -hmm. So, you find the scriptures that you want to begin to see happening in your life, and you meditate on those scriptures. Mm -hmm. You recite them over and over again. For instance, if you're sick in your body, you tend to the altar, you keep the fire upon that altar hot. And you begin to recite Isaiah chapter 53. Mm -hmm. He was wounded for our transgression. Mm -hmm. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, I, I was, was healed. healed. With his stripes, I, I was, was healed. healed. With his stripes, I was healed. healed. With his stripes, I was healed. As you are reciting those things over and over and over again, there is something that is taking place. And God is commanding you to do this twice a day. So that if you fail in this regard, the result is very clear. Joshua one eight says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. So good success is available, but there is a condition. Meditation on God's word day and night, a minimum of twice a day is a requirement. Now, if, it, if you got sick and a doctor told you to go to the hospital, or the doctor told you to take medication, sorry, and you're to take this medication once in the morning and once in the evening, and you only go and you only take the, the, this medication once in the morning, and you don't take it in the evening, what's going to happen? You become worse. You're going to get worse. Your symptoms will persist. Okay? So you have to follow the prescription advice. Look, the Word of God is very serious. Anytime you see God repeating something over and over again, just know these are commandments, man. These are ordinances that are established forever. They can never be changed. Psalms chapter 1, he repeats the same thing. We just read Joshua 1, 8. He said, meditate therein day and night. Now let's look at Psalms chapter 1, from verse 1. He repeats the same thing. He begins to, say, he begins to tell you, 
Blessed is the man that walks not after the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And then look at the result. Verse 3. And he shall be like a tree. Who? The churchgoer on Sunday? Who? The one who only attend, attends church once in a while, you know, when they feel like it. Oh, or, Saturday. You know, yeah. The one who only attends to the, to the altar when everybody else is coming to church on Sunday or Saturday or whatever day you go to church. No. He said he shall be like a tree. Who? The one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates there in day and night. That's a minimum of twice a day. And he will be like a tree. That's the result. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he does shall prosper. Now, have you ever seen a man growing leaves? Men don't grow leaves. Human beings don't grow leaves. What is he referring to? Every human being in the world needs paperwork. You will always need paperwork. When you were born, you were issued with a certificate. Everything that you will ever purchase that is worth anything will have a receipt. You need paperwork. To start a business, you need paperwork. To travel, you need paperwork. You'll have a ticket. You'll have a passport. Anything that really matters in life has paperwork attached to it. Your leaf also will not wither, and whatsoever you do will prosper. And he says you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. The side of the river is called the river bank, okay? The bank controls the flow of currency. He's trying to tell you something. He's trying to tell you something. You will be planted like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. Mm. You're planted on top of the bank, not at the bottom. So the, mm. you're, not, you're not below the bank. The bank is not on top of you. You're planted on top oh. of the bank. Mm. You see? So that means you're controlling the flow of currency. You will be on top of the financial system not the financial system being on top of you. All of this is programmed in the spirit and the tools, the necessary tools to program in the spirit is a lifestyle of prayer, the altar of the Lord, meditation in the word of God, day and night, communion with the Lord, and then we can flow into Psalms 91 because that's, now that's, that's, that's friendship with the Lord. That's, that's friendship with God. I believe that even in the last days, in which we are, anyway, but in the last days, the gospel might not be preached by those who have titles. Mm. The gospel will be preached by the friends of God. It will be preached by those who have intimacy with the Lord. Now let's skip over to Psalms 91. As you look for Psalms 91, uh, when Jesus was uh, doing whatever he did while he was here with his disciples, they witnessed, they saw the miracles, they saw the power, the manifestation of uh, the power of God, the ministry, he walked on water, he did whatever he did. But you know, when they had an opportunity to ask him, you know, they would have said, okay, teach us how to raise the dead. You know, teach us how to, how to uh, make the lame walk. Teach us how to do this. But because they knew where Jesus was getting his power from, they would see Jesus' lifestyle. He was a man of prayer. All the time he was at the altar. Every time after ministry, he, he would separate himself to go and pray. The disciples just requested him to teach them how to pray because it is through prayer that you get things done. Without prayer, you just be hitting on a rock. Nothing will be, you know, materializing. You'll be struggling and hustling in life. There are certain things you can uh, uh, attain in life without hustling. Opportunities, connections. You find yourself in set house without any connection because you're living a prayerful life. 
you find yourself attracting favors that you have not even hustled for. When you are a person of the altar, you attract things and you don't hustle for things. When you see that you are hustling in life, just know that you need to go to, to back to the place where the first man was. And that is in the presence of God. And it takes us back to the altar. God always wanted to fellowship with man. When man disobeyed God, he got out of the presence of God. God was not fellowshipping with him anymore. He was not even seeing him because of the sinful nature. You know, but God always desires that we go back to that place because it is when we go back there that we begin to take authority, that we begin to have dominion, that life, life begins to, to be successful. That is when we have life and life more abundantly. And Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And when he was promising, when he told them that I will leave a helper, go to the, to the upper room, he was teaching them to meditate, to stay at the altar and wait on the Lord. And while they were there, the Spirit of God came upon them. And they did things that educated people could not do. They were very bold. This was Simon Peter, a fisherman, challenging people in government. When you are a person of an altar, you're, you're, you're extraordinary. You're not a normal person. You begin, you begin to live with more spiritual powers. And the person who has spiritual powers, by the way, is the one that rules. Mm. All the presidents and the kings and the queens of this world, they will not tell you something that I'm going to tell you today. They are spiritual people. They have altars. No one just becomes a president without an altar. It is either an altar of God or an altar in the kingdom of darkness, of which most of the people have sold their souls to the devil. But it is very possible for you to become a king or a leader when you're getting power from God's altar. So you can continue. I just felt like I needed to add that. And by the way, you can follow us on our website, uh, www.lifeispiritual.org because they are censoring our videos. We have decided to, you know, open up a website where we'll be sharing more and more. Don't forget to follow us on that website. We'll be giving you more information below in the link. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, as you begin to tend to the altar, as you begin to become or assume the priesthood, because you must assume the priesthood. And the priesthood, let me tell you, the priesthood is the difference between the five wise virgins and the five foolish virgins. It's the difference between the two of them, okay? Because the five foolish virgins, they're only church goers. But the five wise virgins, they are priests. So Psalms 91 from verse 1. It says, he that visits in the secret place once in a while. No. He that dwells. He that dwells mm -hmm. in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So we say that he that stays put in that place, he that dwells there, he that stays there, he that lives there, he that relaxes there, he that sleeps and wakes up there, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now where the Lord is, there is no darkness at all. For the Lord is full of light. There is no darkness there. So even his shadow is filled with light. And that light represents knowledge, revelation, insight, information, understanding, counsel, direction. Okay? So you begin to abide under the shadow, under the influence of wisdom and revelation and knowledge and understanding. Why? Because you are dwelling in that secret place. That secret place is the altar. Priest, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. And then you begin to see the results of being a secret place dweller. You begin to see the results from verse 3 of being a man or woman of the altar. Verse 3, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And he begins to recite, he begins to name the various names of the spirits that we are up against. 
various spirits in the kingdom of darkness. Paul the Apostle said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. So this is a hierarchy of spirits. Mm. Now, as far as we know, demon spirits number in the billions. Mm. Okay? The Bible calls this earth the habitation of cruelty. This planet upon which we live, the Bible calls it the habitation of cruelty. That's because of the sheer population of demon spirits that live upon the face of the earth. Now, he's saying that surely, from verse 3, he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. So the fowler is one of the demons, one of the evil spirits that functions. A malevolent spirit. And it is a fowler, it is a it sets traps for human beings. It sets a trap for someone. And the person falls into it and is ensnared or is trapped. One of the most common traps is like, let's say, a, a young lady is looking for a job. This is common in Africa. A young lady might be looking for a job. She goes for the interview. And the boss who has the power to hire her or to dismiss her says, I'll give you the job but in exchange for one night with you. Okay? That's a trap. That is a trap. Her, her integrity is being tested at that point, but it is a snare. And the fowler has set up those snares, snares of corruption. If she says yes, she may get the job and work for a few months, work for a few years, but the spirit that has been transferred from the boss into her will live with her for a long time steal her star, steal her destiny, steal her future, threaten her health. Everything is at stake. Even her destiny can be derailed mm. because of that one decision. So, so you see the snare of the fowler. The fowler is a very shrewd spirit, highly intelligent, very shrewd, knows how to use corruption. Yes. So, surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, the trap of the fowler, which is a one form, one level of the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness. They may number in the hundreds of millions. And from the noise and pestilence. That's another spirit. It is a noise and pestilence. It, it brings noise. It, it brings derailment. It brings distraction from the things of God. Its duty is to make noise and derail and distract you, to give you information that you don't need to that you that you that you don't need in your life. Information that will not benefit you. So it is a must that you know the hierarchy of the kingdom of darkness. You know the spirits that are at work against you. Paul said we are not ignorant of his devices. Mm. However, we must admit that the church is largely ignorant mm. of, his, of his devices. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, mm. and under his wings shall you trust. Mm. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You see, now his truth is what we are discussing now, the spirituality of life. Mm. His truth, the reality of what we are discussing now, mm the strategies of the kingdom of darkness, what you can expect, the altars that are working either for you or against you. Now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs, Noah, all of them, what do they all have in common? They all walked with God and they all built altars unto the Lord. They were all men of the altar. So why should there be a difference between them and us? Seeing that they are the patriarchs, they have set a pattern for us to follow. So you see, altars are an absolute must in our lives. Now, have you ever walked into a Chinese restaurant? By, I'm, I'm not racist by any means. The Lord Jesus died for every race, every human being, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you've ever walked into a Chinese restaurant, you'll see the fat, golden Chinese man the Buddha, 
You think that's just decoration? No. That is an idol. It's an India. altar. In go, Indian supermarket. To, yeah, go any to any Indian supermarket, you will see the, the elephant type of goddess or the or the lady with like many arms. Those are goddesses. Those are idols. Banks. Banks have them also. But banks they won't be so straightforward because now these the bank owners or the bank managers or the directors, CEOs, these are high level Freemasons. Okay, so even when you fill out your mortgage application and you take it there, remember the Bible says, Thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. It is, it is crucial that you try to avoid borrowing. I know there is a level of borrowing that is manageable debt. And that's, that's, sometimes that's okay. It helps you to expand your business. However, there is just unreasonable debt where you agree, you sign off your name, and for the next 35 years, you're in debt, and you're going to pay off that debt with a job, that's unreasonable debt, okay? As soon as you sign that contract, they take that contract to the Masonic Lodge, and they put it upon the altar. You will pay off that house. If that house is worth 400000 you'll have paid off 200000 300000 and then something tragically happens to you. And now the bank is coming to recover the house. the house, plus the money that you paid, you paid three hundred thousand. The house is actually worth two hundred thousand, but a mortgage is four hundred thousand because the bank has to make profit. Not only have you paid off the house, which is actually worth two hundred thousand, but because it's a mortgage, you have to pay four hundred. Now you paid about three hundred. Now disaster strikes because life is spiritual, and now you can't pay off the mortgage, so they foreclose on the house. They come and take your house, and this is how. Slowly, one after another, the banks will eventually own all of the homes. They will eventually own everything. That is the system of banking and debt. They will eventually own everything. And that, will, that is what is ushering in this thing called the New World Order. So it is very crucial that you understand altars. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18 says, I will remember the Lord my God, for it is he that gives you power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto your fathers, as it is this day. And who are your fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the fathers. So the covenant is the covenant that God made with Abraham. Okay. Now, it is that covenant that you are placing upon the altar of the Lord. And as you pray... You are giving fire and you are giving life to the covenant that God made with Abraham because you have access to that covenant. How do you have access? Galatians chapter 3 verse 29. If ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you connected to the Abrahamic covenant through being born again, as soon as you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, you now have legal access to the covenant that God made with Abraham. Place that covenant upon the altar and pray fire to give it life every day. And the altar is so precise. It is a technology that is beyond any cell phone technology. It is, it is a technology that is beyond anything that you've ever seen. It is marvelous in its in its in its detail, in its ability to fulfill every aspect written in that covenant, like a contract. Mm -hmm. And it will cause you to be like a magnet. You will attract everything that is written on that covenant. Mm -hmm. Everything that is written, you will begin, those things will be, begin to look for you. Mm -hmm. Altars. We became, we, yeah, we stop, we stop struggling in life. We live in Africa. Listen, we are men and women of the altar. We are priests. We are priests unto the Lord. And I'm telling you, if you will take this path in life, you will come into a life of intimacy with the Lord, number one, which is what God wants. Mm -hmm. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, Jesus was choosing out his disciples. Thank you for the good network. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're back. Thank oh. you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, you know, uh, just to add to what you were saying, you get to a point like, you know, when people are struggling to get certain things, we don't struggle. I'll give us a, a testimony. One day we were going for um, a visa, to get a visa, and you know, 
while people were struggling, we happened, you know, my husband went with uh, both our passports, and the person happened to know us. And the person, you know, just like that, favor, and the next thing we knew is that we would just come back and get our visa. You know, so Matthew. when you're a person of, of the altar, things just happen instantly. You don't struggle like other people. Yeah. Yeah, so Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. It's just one, one verse, but it's Jesus speaking. And the Lord Jesus says, and he was speaking to the disciples, he was calling them one by one. And he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. All right? He said, I will make you fishers of men. In other words, in that sentence, in that verse, Jesus is comparing human beings to fish. And he's telling his disciples, I'm going to teach you how to deal with human beings and help them as you would fish. Can you imagine if, a, if you see an aquarium and inside that aquarium, obviously, there are fish swimming and you take one of those fishes out and you, and you put it on the table and it begins to flap one way and flap the other. Mm -hmm. It begins to struggle in life. And it is struggling in life because it is outside of its original environment, okay? Mm -hmm. As soon as you take that fish out of the environment where it belongs, it begins to struggle. And that's what you see a lot of Christians doing. They're flapping on this side. They're flapping on that side. They are struggling on every side. They're trying to find out how it works on this side. Maybe it can work on that side. They're, they're reading all kinds of uh, uh, success books. They're... Mm -hmm. They're, they're trying everything, every suggestion that everybody can give them, they're trying to apply it to their lives, hoping that it's going to work. Mm -hmm. However, that fish will continue struggling in life until that fish is taken and placed back into the water. And then it begins to manifest its genius. It begins to manifest and flourish in life. Okay? Mm -hmm. and so it is so crucial that you understand, just like that fish, the natural environment of a man, the natural habitat of a man is the presence of God. That's why you must have an altar at your home. That's why your home must be an altar. That's why you must commence the lifestyle of priesthood, mm. of intimacy, because now as you become a man or woman of the altar, you are coming back into the original environment, the habitat where you belong. And that was what Adam lost in the beginning. So you see, you need to get right back into Eden. And how do you do so? Get back into the presence of God, that place of intimacy, that Psalms 91 secret place, dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. And I guarantee you, you will be back in the original environment where God intended for you to be in. And then you will begin to flourish. Man flourishes in the presence. Fish flourish in the water. Monkeys flourish in the, in the forest. And human beings flourish in the presence of God. When they come out of the presence and they leave the presence and the fire dies down, they begin to struggle in life like fish out of water. And that's why I call them fish out of water symptoms. Mm -hmm. Fish out of water symptoms. Mm -hmm. Struggling in life. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. And you know, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. They are all kinds. You know, uh, just like a, a person can be possessed and be turned into an altar that is controlling an entire region. Like a person can control a principality. A person can control a territory. You know, we have territorial witches, territorial wizards. They have been turned into evil altars. We are altars. We can, if we can house God, you know, if God can dwell in our bodies, you know, uh, we are capable of doing supernatural things as you know, because we are created in God's image and God has given us that, those abilities to excel, to do extraordinary things, to co-create, to live uh, a life that is supernatural. That's why you see people are always going to look for power at whatever cost, because life is spiritual. Even if we abandon the fact that, you know, people, many people yeah. trust their books. They say, okay, I, I have a master's, I have a doctorate, I have a PhD. I, I don't need those spiritual things, but I'm telling you to keep those jobs. You can get someone with only 
one degree, getting a position, a higher position than you when you have a PhD, because this person has mastered the art of, of being on an altar while you have not mastered that. And you keep wondering, you're like, why is it that people come and they are promoted the following month? I have been in this office for 20 years. I have never been promoted. Life is spiritual. We are going to pray with you, and uh, we just want to encourage you to build altars. You can follow us on our website, www.lifespiritual.org. But O-R-G. Yeah, so uh, we'll continue to upload more videos. We'll continue to see. We, we are not intimidated by those threatening messages and the censoring of our videos. We are not intimidated, but we live for Christ. We are going to preach the gospel whether the enemy likes it or not. And we are going to expose the kingdom of darkness. So uh, we are going to conclude with a word of prayer. But before, uh, we also want to let you know that we, our book, Erica Part 4, Death, Hell, and Heaven is out. And you can also get our book on our, our website. Yeah, so I think we can pray. Yeah, and um, also don't be very surprised about what you see happening in the U.S. and happening in Europe in terms of the protests. Um, a lot of these things are being, you know, initiated. That They, they begin they in the spirit. They are staged. A lot of these things are staged, okay? However, we do know that no matter what happens, mm. no matter what looks like it's happening, we are heading towards the manifestation of what has already been prophesied in the scriptures. Mm. So you should not be surprised about, you know, the, the George Floyd uh, situation, every, you know, the, the, the anger that is, that is arising, um, the chaos that is arising, you know, because of racism, because of what is taking place with... Um, you know, brutality against black people is very real. Um, and, you know, what happens to George Floyd is absolutely oh, is sad. It is reprehensible. Um, it's unfortunate. And one thing we know is that the true identity of the Hebrew people will be revealed. It is truth. You cannot hide it. You cannot stop it. It is truth that is going to come out. It is the nature of truth. You can try to hide it for some time, but eventually... It will burst through. And so we know that, you know, black people, um, uh, Bantu bloodlines um, are the real, the, the true Hebrews of antiquity. And so the genuine reason why they are hated by all nations of the world is because of their godly heritage. Okay? And so that is the true essence. And I think we'll, we'll get into the issues of race a bit deeper when we we're talking about Nephilim and when we we're talking about um, the satanic bloodlines because that is the true essence of racism. The true essence of racism is this, the children of God versus the children of the kingdom of darkness. The true essence of racism is David versus Goliath. Goliath was a descendant of the Nephilim. His blood was corrupted Nephilim fallen angel blood. But David was a child of God a man of God, a man after God's own heart. And when the Spirit of God rested upon him, he became lethal. And Goliath found out the hard way. So it's important that you understand the roots of racism, the truth of the depth of racism, is that these people are the people of God. They are the children of God. And God has promised them that the inheritance, which is the whole world, belongs to them. And so there's hatred and there's jealousy and there's anger and there's wrath because of that, and so, you know, but no weapon fashioned against us shall prosper, mm -hmm. and every tongue speaking words against us is condemned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the amazing thing is that God has extended salvation to all races. Mm -hmm. So when you see a particular race being hated on the most by the world, we know Jesus said, the world cannot love you. The world hated me. If the world has hated me, the world will also hate you. Now, if you see the world hating any kind of particular race, who, who, who is hated the most? The darker races. And why? Because they carried the heritage of God first. They carry the bloodline of the Lord. And so they, they are hated because the God of this world hates them. Okay? And that's why there's so much hatred. But and then there are also people who benefit from this 
whatever is happening, mm. because it is about the new world order, order out of chaos. Mm. So whenever you see chaos, people fighting each other, sicknesses, viruses, bacteria, just know that they are preparing the world for the new world. Mm. That's why you see these companies, telecom companies, saying welcome to the new world. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, they are talking about these things. You know, uh, I have written about uh, the new world order in Erica Part Two, 18 years with Lucifer. But you know, we'll continue to teach on it. You know, we'll continue to explain to you what the new world order is about. It's about uh, creating chaos and coming up with solutions. They create poverty and they come up with solutions. They create sicknesses, and they come up with solutions. So I just want to encourage you not to go for, for, for those va vaccines. OK. In as much as it is difficult for me to say it, let me say it. Network issues. Yes. Be very, very careful. I have prayed for people who have taken their children for vaccines and their children have had autism. After being vaccinated, they have complications. So what to do? We adore you. We adore you. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, so we have the church has been divided for a long time, you know. Followers of Pastor So and so don't don't listen to Pastor So and so. And now God has brought back the church together, now we are one. And now that we are one, the enemy is in trouble because the Bible says that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So no matter what they do, they will not prevail against the church. So be blessed. We are going to pray with you as we conclude. Yeah, yeah Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for your people. We thank you for this message. We thank you we thank you for touching them. We thank you, Almighty Father, for uh, speaking to us, ministering to us. God, I pray that you meet them at their points of need. Almighty Father, touch them, set them free, those that are struggling in life, oh God. Deliver them, Almighty Father. We assign your ministering angels, Almighty King of Kings, to locate them wherever they are, Almighty Father. Heal the sicknesses and disease. We come against witchcraft. We come against sorcery. We destroy and demolish. Every satanic altar that is operating against their lives, we destroy those altars in the mighty name of Jesus. We take authority over principalities and powers of darkness that have been tormenting their lives. Whatever has, uh, whatever has been oppressing them, we rebuke it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we pray for restoration of destinies, restoration of stars, restoration of peace in homes. We come against divorce. We yes. come against that spirit that fights marriages. Yes. In Jesus' name, we rebuke barrenness. We come yes. against HIV. We come yes. against COVID-19. We declare healing of mm. Father upon the sick. Every sick person that is watching this video, Almighty yes. Father, I pray that you stretch forth your healing hand, Almighty yes. Father, yes. and heal them, set them free, Almighty King yes. of Kings, yes. that they will give testimonies that they will rejoice. Oh God, I pray for a financial breakthrough for those that are struggling in life. Oh God, I pray for an open heaven, divine favor, divine connections. Almighty Father, God, I pray that you build a wall of protection round about everyone that is watching this video. We pray that you build a hedge of protection that the enemy cannot access, cause them to be invisible before the enemy shield them from every satanic arrow. Shield them, oh God. Arise and let their enemies be scattered. They come to them in one direction, but let them scatter in seven directions. Give them the hunger and the desire to pray, to read the Bible, to serve you. Holy Spirit, lead them each and every step of the way because your word says that those that are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Bless them with the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the blessings that make rich and add no sorrow. We give you all the glory and honor. We pray all this, believing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 We love you so much. Be blessed. If you, uh, uh, some people have been contacting me and they have issues with spiritual marriages, you can read uh, Erica Part 3, Witchcraft and Spiritual Warfare. 
financial solutions. There is the truth about money. You get uh, financial knowledge. And then also we have a new book, Erica Part 4, Death, Hell, and Heaven. Be blessed. We love you so much. May God richly bless you. I know that next time, maybe if we meet, if God allows us to meet, you'll be telling us about what happened when you built your altar. We'll be listening to different testimonies. May God richly bless you.